look at if you sorry about that at, no problem we look and at i want to and i want to thank you for your so you two have been a, a very good uh uh you know uh, uh supporter of us um you dr gersh oh. was also at our conference last uh last march uh, and she's been on our webinars a, a number of times and she's she's been a, a great fan you know a great great supporter so, for our group well, so. well you guys do great things and so i'm always um supporting the the downtrodden as you do right we you know we have to you know voice our opinion sometimes you know it's like lost in the wind but i'm always uh, trying to educate on all the benefits of of hormones because hormones which are very simple in terms of their what they do not when you get to a cellular level but in terms of what they do which is deliver vital information to cells to give directions for what the cells should do and yet um, poor hormones, uh, particularly estrogen is maligned, no end. And so I want people to understand what these hormones do, particularly estrogen in the form of estradiol. So this time around, I've talked about a number of different things. Um, I'm gonna talk about hair and skin and for women and men too, but I always hear from women, they're very concerned about the status of their hair and their skin, you know, because um, just having looking in the mirror, a lot of people don't want to look in the mirror anymore. They just like feel very depressed, you know, because and they're always like pulling their face up, you know, it's like, like that looks better. OK, so, you know, we don't like sagging. We don't like wrinkling. Um, we don't like round spots and we don't like losing our hair. And every one of you, I'm sure, has seen old ladies in a nursing home or in assisted living facility and their hair is very fine you know you can see lots of their scalp well nobody likes that okay and this is all estrogen related and when i use the word estrogen i'm using it incorrectly and i'm just telling you up front because it's just common usage but estrogen is a family of hormones it's no estrogen it's the estrogens really and so there's different types of estrogens, just like B vitamins. No one says, take a B vitamin. What B vitamin? There's like 12 B vitamins. So estrogens are a family of hormones. And the one that the ovary makes, which is the one that has the balance effect throughout all the, the body's receptors, is estradiol. So when I say estrogen, just know I'm doing it wrong, but it's just common usage. But I'm really saying it's estradiol, okay? Unless I say something else. So we're going to talk about um, estrogen, but really estradiol and skin and some about the hair. And there's some things I didn't make slides of, but I'll I'll bring it in for a treatment, which I'll tell you like a little preview would be like low dose oral minoxidil. I don't know if any of you have even tried that. Um, some of the data is looking pretty um, potentially good. And I've been prescribing it, but it's I don't have you have to give hair a long time to grow back. So I have to wait a little longer to get some of my um, feedback. So skin is actually one of the most or affected organs by menopause. And of course it's very visible. And one of the areas that skin, which I'm not really gonna talk about, but just a mention, because this is so important because when we talk about giving hormone therapy, the mantra for the conventional medical world is stop, and don't give it over a certain age. That makes no sense. It would be like if someone had their thyroid gland removed, we wouldn't say, oh, well, now you're 65. You don't get any more thyroid hormone. Like that's irrational, right? You just take it for life. If you need it and you're deficient, you need to just keep taking it because we're not growing a new set of ovaries anytime soon. At least I don't think it'll be in my lifetime, maybe in my you know granddaughter's lifetime. But um, and so we need to think about going on hormones forever and then the other the mantra is not just that you stop it at any age but also that you don't start it if you've been out from menopause for 10 years or more and that also does not make sense and what do i base that on actually i base it on the skin okay because there was a lot of research back in the 1990s and early 2000s before the women's health initiative shut everything down and made everyone except us you know feel um hostile to estrogen and 
But there was a lot of data coming out, very interesting studies applying estradiol cream to skin. And what they found was that in just two weeks, and these were women who'd been out in menopause for any length of time, in just two weeks of applying estradiol to the skin, there was visible reduction in wrinkles. Okay, visible. Now, I will tell you all my secrets. It's just between us, right? Like, like, you know, like when we were in Las Vegas, it stays here, but it stays here too. Okay. So I use compounded estradiol cream every day on my face. And people have said, I look like I have fewer wrinkles. I think I do, but they've actually published review, peer reviewed um, um, articles where they actually did this and they showed visible reduction in wrinkles. And this is at an you know, older age, people had never been on hormones. Also, what else is skin that we know clearly improves with estradiol use? And that's vagina. The vagina is a type of skin, it's epithelium. And we know that at any age, if you put estrogen cream in the vagina or even a tablet or, you know, which I don't think work as well, but if you do, you're going to see improvement. It doesn't matter how many years you've been out. So clearly the receptors aren't dead. Also, they had peer-reviewed articles back in the 1990s and early 2000s, and they're coming back now. There, there's like, there's more interest and it's coming back in the dermatology literature, using it for wound healing. So what they found is if they put estradiol cream on wounds, it increased the rate of healing. So I'll show you some of that. So, I mean, skin is really impacted by menopause and women age very rapidly. If you have any friends and you haven't seen them for a few years, like you lost track of them with COVID and then they came back into your life and they're a couple, say um, they're in their mid fifties, and you hadn't seen them for three years, and you look at, we'll call them John and Mary, and you look at John and Mary, you haven't seen them in a while, John looks about the same, and Mary looks like eight years older, because she didn't know about hormones, nobody told her. Women really age visibly and rapidly, um, I'll show you some of that data, when they lose their hormones. So, and I talk about this over and over, there are receptors throughout the entire body for estrogen. And I put like skin here, you know, in um, yellow, because that's what we're really talking about. But as you know, every organ system relates to everything. And I'm not going to go into it much, but just as a side note, there's a gut skin access. I mean, it's like a big deal. So what goes on in the gut affects the skin and vice versa. So if you have a dysbiotic gut microbiome, it's going to translate into problems with the skin. So um, a lot of kids who have acne, oh my goodness, they really need to clean up their gut. And I know you know all this, and it can just by cleaning up the diet, cleaning up the gut, improving like leaky gut, gut barrier function, and improving the gut microbiome, um, getting a clean anti-inflammatory diet filled with antioxidants and polyphenols and fiber and so on that nurture the gut microbiome, you can clear up acne. I mean, tremendous benefits. And for older women, it can really benefit the skin to look way more attractive and be healthier. And of course, the hair will look that much better as well. We all know that nutrient deficiencies translate into poor hair. Now, this is a very important little takeaway here. This Estrogen is so necessary for skin health that the skin actually makes estrogen. Um, it also can make testosterone, okay? And it makes um, dihydrotestosterone. And when you, so you can see in here, the adrenal androgen, DHEAS, dihydroepiandrosterone sulfate, comes to the skin, and then it gets broken down to DHEA, and then androstenedione, dion, which can then turn into testosterone. All estradiol, here's 17 beta estradiol, all comes from testosterone. You can't make estradiol except from testosterone. So testosterone and estradiol can be made in the skin. That's why in women, if you measure a circulating level of testosterone, it really may not accurately in any way reflect the tissue level. 
of testosterone. And that also can reflect in women who have um, excessive facial hair or acne, and then you measure their circulating testosterone level and it's not even elevated. And you want to like, what the heck's going on here? Well, they're converting it from the DHEAS that's coming from the adrenal gland. And women and men both make quite a lot. Um, it does decline with aging, but it makes that people make a lot of that. And that's the primary source of tissue testosterone like in the skin from women. Of course, men have plenty of circulating testosterone normally. And then when you have 5-alpha reductase, 5-alpha reductase is the enzyme. It comes in different types, but um, it converts testosterone into the more aggressive, we'll say active form of testosterone, DHT, dihydrotestosterone. And what activates or upregulates 5-alpha reductase to make more DHT? It's inflammation. So aging, what sometimes we talk about inflammaging, aging increases the conversion in the skin of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. And why does that matter? Well, dihydrotestosterone is what triggers androgenic alopecia, you know, like hair loss in both men and women. And that's why they give drugs like finasteride to block 5-alpha reductase so you don't get too much dihydrotestosterone for and in men, you know, then they would get loss of hair, androgenic alopecia. The problem is we need 5-alpha reductase. It actually works in the brain as well. <clears throat> and DHT is not evil. We don't want to like get rid of it in the body. Um, what we want to do is control inflammation. And that is actually one of the reasons why there is a correlation between men who have hair loss on their head, they often have higher amounts of body hair, like a thicker beard or more hair on their chest or their back or their arms and legs and such, um, and increased risk for cardiovascular events because it's the inflammation that's driving the upregulation of 5-alpha reductase and turning that testosterone higher and higher into DHT. But the solution isn't really get rid of your 5-alpha reductase, it's get rid of the inflammation, right? Because it's inflammation that's driving the cardiovascular events. You know, the hair is just a reflection of it. The hair changes. And in women, the same. So if, if a girl has a lot of inflammation in her body, like she's obese, she has PCOS, then she's going to have upregulation of 5-alpha reductase and end up with too much DHT. And the solution is really get rid of all that inflammation. Like that, that's not get rid of all your testosterone, get rid of the inflammation so you don't have abnormally upregulated 5-alpha reductase. Now, when you have in the skin, in men, this is how men get estrogen in their skin, 17 beta estradiol in their skin. The enzyme aromatase is present in skin and will convert the testosterone that's circulating that gets into to the skin and also that's made in the skin from the adrenal precursors into 17 beta estradiol. So men have plenty of estrogen in their skin, but it's not circulating, it's made in the skin. And it, it does so many important things because estrogen turns on and off the inflammatory process. So if you have a cut and then you get, it gets red and then, you know, you get like, obviously the immune system is activated. Um, that's all triggered by estrogen. Estrogen turns on the inflammatory response so that you can fight off invading pathogens, infections, and deal with trauma. And then it turns off the inflammatory switch so that you can then proceed to downregulate that inflammatory response and go into a phase of inflammation, downregulation, resolution of inflammation, and healing. That's when you get the activation from the platelets of growth factors and you get new blood vessels formed, new tissue, you know, you get all the growth factors. They're all stimulated by estrogen in the skin. That's why as men and women age, they heal much slower from injuries to the skin, like a cut or a burn will heal much slower. And as we know, unfortunately, there's a whole host of people out there who have 
wounds that never heal. That's why there are wound centers everywhere, you know, dealing with non-healing wounds. And every one of those people has estrogen deficiency in their skin. And um, many of the men, of course, have low levels of testosterone as well. And so that's actually important for men and for women, they have no produced estrogen from their ovaries. And so that's a problem. And it's estradiol that's really the critical estrogen that, that does the on and off switch for inflammation, promotes growth and you know growth factors. Estrone. So estrone is the dominant estrogen that's made in the menopause in fat tissue, predominantly adipose tissue, which also has the enzyme aromatase. And just as 5-alpha reductase is upregulated, becomes more active in a state of inflammation, so too does the enzyme aromatase. So inflammation upregulates aromatase. And what happens is you end up with too much estrone, okay? And estrone can't be converted to estradiol when you have a lot of inflammation because the enzyme for the conversion is unfortunately downregulated. So you have all this estrone and estrone only works on the alpha receptor for estrogen, which activates the immune cells. All the innate immune cells have predominantly alpha receptor. And so it's like turning the on switch for inflammation, but you don't have the proper off switch. So you get into more chronic states of inflammation and you can't go into that anti-inflammatory um, resolution phase. That's like people who had COVID and had a cytokine storm. It's like they knew how to make inflammation, but they didn't do a great job of it because they had dysfunctional inflammation and they couldn't turn it off. And that's what happens to women in menopause when all they have is a lot of estrone and they don't have the estradiol. That's why it's so important when we give hormone replacement to women to give them adequate amounts of estradiol because when you have plenty of estradiol, it actually downregulates the enzyme aromatase so you don't get all that exogenous fat produced, horrible amounts of estrone. And it's that's where the evil twin comes in. People know that when women have too much of estrone, they, they have some problems that happen in their body, but they're not distinguishing that from estradiol. And so it all gets lumped into the same basket. And then they say, you know, estrogen are, is evil, but it's not estrogen is evil. Inflammation, unregulated, uncontrolled inflammation is evil. And then it, you know, creates this overproduction of estrone that has nothing to do with ovarian produced estradiol or giving estradiol to women in menopause as hormone replacement therapy, which actually will prevent that chronic state of inflammation and allow the immune system to be properly regulated. So, you know, it's just complicated, you know, that the um, estrogen receptors, I mentioned estrone only works on the alpha, estradiol works on all the receptors, alpha and beta, and the membrane receptors. And they're, they're different, they interact with one another, they can up and down regulate each other. So it's important to just take away that estrogens are not all the same. Estriol is a whole different bag of worms. Estriol only works on the beta receptor, which down regulates alpha, <clears throat> which is essential in pregnancy. Estriol is the, the hormone, uh, the estrogen made by the placenta in large quantities. And it downregulates when you have high beta, downregulates alpha, um, which downregulates the innate immune system, which is why pregnant women do not um, have as robust an immune response to infections like COVID, chickenpox, the flu virus, and so on. And they're more likely to have problems. It also downregulates the innate immune system. So you have fewer inflammatory cytokines. So that's why autoimmune diseases, particularly like MS, will often go into remission during pregnancy, only to flare horribly when pregnancy is over. But um, so we don't want to mimic pregnancy. It's a whole unique hormonal milieu designed to allow an alien to grow in a woman, you know, known as the fetus, right? So our immune systems don't destroy it. And it's a very calculated balance between inflammation um, to allow insulin um, to be produced more by having a little insulin resistance. So you put on more fat and you get more sugar to the baby. Anyway, we don't want to try to mimic pregnancy in women who are postmenopausal. So remember, estriol is great in pregnancy 
and everyone makes some of it from estradiol, but we don't want to give large amounts because we're doing all kinds of things we don't understand to the innate immune system and that we're not, we don't go there. We don't have any good data. So when we look at estrogen in the skin, um, like it, there's an interaction with IGF-1. So some people say down with IGF-1, you know, it's like pro-cancer. And I know that's talked about by a lot of people, but of course we need IGF-1, like everything in life. We want the right balance because IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor one, is actually really important for skin health. So we never wanna go into chronic fasting. So we know that when you do periodic fasting, it down-regulates growth hormone, it's down-regulates IGF-1, and that is good because then you don't have growth or like proliferation. And that's what triggers autophagy or rejuvenation of internal cells. But we don't want that all the time. We want this beautiful balance of fasting and eating. We want to have burning and we want to have growth and proliferation all in a controlled state. So that's why we never want to be in a constant state of fasting because then we won't make IGF-1. And IGF-1 is really important for reepithelialization, for having proper skin fibroblast function and sebocytes and so on. So, um, and it's interesting, there's a very strong relationship between estrogen and they've set, lim, linked it to estrogen receptor alpha that you can actually have anti-inflammatory effects. So everything when it's in the right proportions, the right balance works beautifully to keep the skin beautifully functioning in all respects. And it turns out that when they look at male and female skin, estrogen receptors seem to be an equal sort of balance. And look what happens when we get old. When they looked at people, now these are not women for, or men on any kind of hormone replacement therapy. So uh, we don't know, we don't have data. Well, like I hope that it's better if you're on hormones, but we just have no data because nobody's studying it. But we know that the estrogen receptor beta in people who are not on hormone therapy is actually significantly decreased in the epidermis of the skin. So maybe it's use it or lose it, you know, and that's, you know, so that's a part of the problem. But we do know that when you, you apply estrogen directly to the skin, even in older people, it still shows benefit. But like everything, younger is always better. And I personally think, although I can't prove it, that if we keep hormones going indefinitely, we will not see the loss if to any significant degree that we do of receptor function. Okay. So you know what? I should go into. Yeah, that's I didn't put this right. Okay. So now I got the slide in slide deck mode properly. Okay. So now um, menopause is a huge impact throughout the entire body and the skin as well. So if we look at, and I have a lot of slides that are a little repetitious, so I won't like say it too many times over and over, but look at some of the things that happen to all the skin layers, every single layer of the skin. You know, if you haven't looked at it lately, you know, you can just Google, you know, skin and you'll see, you know, the epidermis, the dermis, and then all the different types of appendages within skin, like all of these, uh, the different types of tissue types within skin, they, every one of them, 100% have estrogen receptors. So when you don't have enough estrogen in the skin, um, and you know, in women, you, you don't have enough, oops, there's not enough um, um, conversion locally. The skin of women is not designed to make the same kinds of estrogen as we age. It just doesn't have the same capability because it's designed to get most of the estrogen in the skin from the ovarian production, and men are designed to make it more locally in the skin. Women have that capability, but it's not as strong. The same thing, by the way, in the brain. So after menopause, um, women cannot get as much estradiol in the brain. They live in a state of estrogen deficiency of estradiol in their brain. And um, in the reproductive years, for example, men men's brains make six to eight times as much estradiol through the conversion of androgen precursors as um, women's brains, but women do fine because they get all that estradiol from their ovaries. But after menopause, women do not do as well in their brain. That's why they have two and a half fold times the number, the incidence of Alzheimer's. Well, the same kind of happens in the skin. That's why women have much more rapid aging 
of their skin as well compared to men. And you probably have noticed that. Um, so there's a decrease in collagen. And this is actually very, very rapid and significant, a decrease in the water, fat layers, elasticity, and the actual thickness of the skin. In fact, if you looked at older skin, sometimes it's like, whoa, it's like translucent. It's so thin, right? It's like, you can just see like they're invis like invisible, you know? So that's a terrible thing for skin. And when they touch anything, they bruise so readily because they have like no cushion whatsoever in their skin. So when we look at all these different types of skin um, cells, estrogen has beneficial effects on everyone. The keratinocytes, the dermal fibroblasts, the melanocytes, hair follicles, hair growth, sebaceous glands, and the sebum production, and the apocrine glands, the, the ability to make new blood vessels for wound healing, all the immune responses, and skin cancer. Of course, I'm sure you all know skin cancers are much more prevalent as people age because their skin is not as resilient and it can't the immune system of the skin becomes hampered when hormones decrease and the immune system becomes dysregulated and of course pigmentation we have all seen so-called age spots well that will be much less if women have adequate estrogen in their skin and so when you don't have enough estrogen you know you get no, you don't have the same ability to defend against oxidative stress in the skin, which underlies all kinds of problems. But as I mentioned, you have lower thickening of the skin, thinner collagen and reduced elasticity. So you get skin that's sagging, it doesn't bounce back. And especially around the neck and the jawline and the cheeks, that's why plastic surgeons are so busy doing neck lifts and jaw lifts and all that kind of stuff. And then the increased wrinkles and fine lines, particularly, you know, the, the lines above the lip and around the corners of the eyes and a lot of dryness. I mean, women after menopause, like everything is, I can think of like dried up. They have dry vagina, they have dry eyes, they have dry mouth, less saliva and dry skin. And that's very unpleasant, you know, reduced vascularity so it doesn't heal as well. And all the protective mechanisms are not, um, are impaired and you know, manifest by impaired wound healing or hair loss, pigment changes, and higher rates of skin cancers. Um, so women see a very rapid aging of their skin, even beginning in the perimenopausal years. And it's shown that skin thickness can go down by over 1% in terms of its collagen content. Um, you know, so this is really a problem and it can rise you know, as you get older, you can lose more and more at a faster rate. So in the types of collagen fibers, like type one and type three can decrease by around 30% in just the first five years of menopause. So think about that close to a third of all the collagen in the skin is gone in the first five years of menopause. Think how that translates into rapid aging with all of these, you know, the thinning and the collagen goes down, the fat goes down. And so this is related not to age, it's related to loss of estrogen. So, so many times they talk about it's an aging problem. I don't think of it as aging. I think of it as deficiencies and you have a deficiency of estrogen, then you get a deficiency of elastin and you get a deficiency of seep, the proper sebums and so on. And um, like I mentioned, there's a lot of data to show that by giving estrogen, we can really delay. I can't say you're not gonna have aging of skin, but you can really, really um, decrease it. And remember I mentioned that androgens can also be converted from the adrenal into estrogen, but in elderly people, the amount that's even in their best case scenario of being able to convert it, the amount of adrenal DHAS can be down like to only 10 to 20% of the peak levels in earlier years. So that it even impedes the ability to make skin produced estrogen, you know, even, uh, even worse. So here's like one study that showed that if you take, this is oral estrogen because that's what they studied um, back in the day. So six months of oral estrogen increased skin collagen by about six and a half percent. So that's that's a good start. And that's with just oral estrogen. And they another study showed that one year of oral estrogen can increase the thickness of the dermis by 30%. I mean, I don't know why any woman wouldn't want to be on estrogen. I mean, it's like, it's, it's not just gonna 
make her skin better. It makes everything better. But every woman, I mean, the, I have a plastic surgeon's office next to my office. It's packed with women all the time. I keep thinking, why are these women not on estrogen? You know, it's like drives me crazy. And I had like a study that I mentioned that showed that topical administration of estrogen increased keratinocyte proliferation, epidermal thickness in just two weeks of use. And so there's like quite a few studies. I told you in the 1990s, early 2000s, there was so much interest in estrogen for skin health. Um, and it just dissipated after the Women's Health Initiative. But there's a little bit of a comeback now, but just a little bit. And so at topical, you know, use of topical estrogen clearly increases collagen. It increases the elastin fibers, the fibrolin that will make the skin more elastic so that you know, if you pull it, it springs back. Nobody wants to pull their skin and it just droops, right? Um, we want to have the youngest, healthiest skin possible. And estrogen increases growth factors, as I mentioned, to improve dermal fibroblast proliferation. And it actually, you know, is very good for lowering, down-regulating the inflammatory response. Remember, if you don't have the proper estrogen around, you go into a pro-inflammatory state, and then you have over- output from the immune cells. They're like weapons of mass destruction without control when you don't have proper estradiol and you get release of these really toxic enzymes that do a lot of damage like um, matrix metalloproteinases. And of course that's happening in the brain, just as a note from the microglia, the mo modified macrophages in the brain that is a contributor to creating all the damage of the neurons in the brain from these uncontrolled immune cells. Well, it also happens in the skin, which causes degradation of the skin. And so in talking about the elastin will go down, like I said, I put a lot of similar slides, but you can have, I'll give you all my slides. And if you ever wanna look at it, you can. Um, and so women who were on estrogen for like five years after menopause had significantly when they measured significantly fewer wrinkles. I mean, come on, ladies, why would you not like buy that, right? And I've talked, you know, over and over about wound healing. Um, it accelerates re-epithelialization, uh, improves granulation tissue. And so just think about women who have surgery when they have to have surgery and they have healing from surgery. Women who um, have hormones on board will do so much better with any kind of surgical procedure. Um, and after when women over 65 who were on estrogen replacement therapy, they were much less likely to develop a venous ulceration or a pressure sore. So I don't know about you, but I've had relatives who've gotten pressure sores and you can see, I mean, they're just skin is just, they lie in a certain way and uh, they just get a pressure sore, you know, these decubitus ulcers. And they're so hard and so slow to heal and women on hormones they're just less likely. And people die from these decubitus ulcers and they can change the quality of life so much. And it doesn't take much to do it. I had one patient who got a terrible pressure sore and this was at a local hospital because she accidentally fell and broke her leg. And it wasn't like, it was her lower leg. It wasn't even that bad, but they put her in bed and told her now don't move too much because you know, your leg has to be set. And they just said, you know, like kind of stay put. So she lied there for quite a few hours. And then when they checked her to take her to surgery, cause they had to put like a pin in her, um, in her bone, uh, they found that she'd already in just a few hours of lying flat and nobody moved her properly, that she'd already gotten a pressure sore on um, her coccyx area. It was horrible. And it took like a year practically to heal that thing. It was a nightmare. She was going to wound clinic all the time. So all of that for nothing. But if she'd been on hormones, um, this was, you know, I hadn't had her on hormones. I had just met her when this happened and she would have healed so much faster and so much better and probably never would have gotten the pressure sore in the, in the first place. And all the inflammatory response, as I mentioned, is all modulated by estrogen. So you don't get this chronic state of inflammation that can promote chronic wounds. So, um, you know, we just know that nothing works well after menopause when you don't have enough estrogen, but when you give estrogen and you get much better re-epithelialization, um, there are studies that show that estrogen use prior and after creating a wound 
you know, these are like studies show that um, it's much better when you have the hormones on board. And um, when they gave estrogen therapy to get a good level, the postmenopausal women's wounds healed in a, at a comparable speed to the younger women wounds. So, I mean, that that's like rejuvenation or we start early. So once again, it's not about how many years you have, it's how much estrogen you have in your body it makes all the difference in the world. So um, these are like, I just kept putting data together um, and putting these slides. So like I said, it's a little bit um, repetitious, but you know, to, uh, tissue growth factor beta is really important. I know some people like think that it's bad, but it's only bad like everything else when things are dysregulated, but we need it for healing. And old women do not make proper um, growth factors like TGF beta, and it's reversed and you make enough growth factors, not just TGF beta, but all the growth factors when you have enough estradiol on board so you can heal wounds. And I mentioned this because I have an aunt, don't tell her I said this, she um, is elderly and she had a skin cancer and um, boy, did it ever take a long time. They had to do a pretty wide excision. It took a forever. It took months to heal that wound. And, um, you know, she was not my patient, but finally I was able to work with her and her doctor. And we actually, even though she's older, we got her on hormones and um, she's been fine ever since. So uh, it's just wonderful to see the benefits of hormones in, in terms of accelerating wound healing. Um, so, you know, when you look at wounds, you see the extracellular matrix is more normal. You have proper collagen deposition and proper collagen synthesis and control of those um, out of control matrix metalloproteinases. So we want everything right. We want it when we want it and we don't want it when we don't want it. In terms of pigmentation, I'm sure you've all seen women who get, and men, you know, we all get like age spots. And um, it turns out that the melanocytes are very responsive to um, estrogen. And this is where the confusion has come in because hyperpigmentation like melasma increases in pregnancy and with the use of oral contraceptives. But take note, it's not because it's, it's not human bioidentical estradiol. It's a different type of estrogen. So that's where you have to get it clear and not put them all in the same basket. So pregnancy is actually a pro-inflammatory state. And I keep having to tell people that women who become pregnant have to become a little inflammatory because what happens is they have they immediately get altered gut microbiome and then they have leaky gut. This is intended by nature, but it's a fine line to keep them under the threshold of developing pregnancy-induced hypertension, gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, and so on. But you develop a gut dysbiosis, leaky gut, and that increases inflammation, which triggers increased insulin resistance, higher levels of insulin, higher levels of glucose for the purpose of trying to fatten up the pregnant woman fast. Because in the ancient times when humans came on earth, there wasn't a lot of food around and pregnant women needed to store a lot of fat so that they could have like spare for like for nursing and to get through in case there wasn't any food and also to fatten up the baby so that you had to have higher blood in, blood sugar and insulin levels okay and that's because of the different hormones so we don't want to compare pregnancy and the status of the immune system in pregnancy to like non-pregnant states so once we see that melanocytes are upregulated where is that? So melanocytes will become more active in an inflamed environment, which happens in pregnancy. So you get hyperpigmentation and melasma in some women and also oral contraceptives because oral contraceptives are not the same as having normal estrogen, like in a reproductive age woman and oral contraceptives are pro-inflammatory. That's why they increase the risk of blood clots. Everyone knows that. Well, blood clots don't live in isolation. It's part of the inflammatory response is to activate platelets to clot. And not only do they clot, but they wall off infections, creating abscess cavities. So, you know, can be life-saving. And then platelets will then become changed during the 
the resolution of inflammation produce growth factors which help heal and, and resolve infect inflammation but in pregnancy it just goes into the pro-inflammatory state it's because uh, the S birth control pills go into the body as estrone which is the on switch for inflammation without the off switch so think of birth control pills and pregnancy as pro-inflammatory and inflammation triggers hyperpigmentation and that's why aging, which is like inflammaging, causes melanocytes to make more pigment. So if you have patients that have age spots, they have melasma, that's a sign of inflammation that you need to tackle, okay? I mean, don't just give them bleaching agents. I mean, I'm like, that's kind of toxic bleaching agents, but that's what they use, right? On, on melanocyte created melasma and age spots, but um, it's really poison, but that's really not addressing the underlying issue, which is systemic inflammation, which also includes inflammation in the skin. And aging skin shows a lot of inflammation with pro-inflammatory cytokines, matrix metalloproteinases, and of course, chronic states of inflammation lead to DNA breakage. And that's why skin cancer is the number one most prevalent cancer that there is. And estrogen has all of these cytoprotective effects to attenuate reactive oxygen species in the skin and maintain proper control. And also if you have adequate estrogen, by the way, then you will have fewer inflammation markers. Like if you, someone goes out and gets too much sun UV light, you know, which is a carcinogen, if it's too much UV light, then it turns out that if estrogen helps protect against damage from UV light and the skin cancers that can develop from such things. In terms of um, estrogen and hair, there's a strong relationship. Women who have wonderful estrogen in their body, great level, they have the beautiful hair that they look like the hair commercials, okay? Um, assuming it's not actual, um, what do you call it? You know, the little hair extras, you know, the fake hairs that they put on whatever, extenders. Yeah, I don't have them, but maybe I should get them, but I don't have hair extenders. But that is um, what makes a lot of women, you know, feel better when they use the fake hair extenders because their hair is so thin and estrogen is wonderful for growing hair. It improves, you know, the growth factors, the transcription, it reduces cytokines in the, in the hair follicles. And Hair estrogen um, helps promote length of antigen. So hair has three phases, antigen, which is growing, catagen, which is resting. And then from catagen resting, it goes into telogen, which is falling out. And once it gets into catagen, it can't go back to antigen. So as you probably know, some women can grow their hair all the way down well below their butts and others, it just gets to the shoulder. That's the antigen phase. And the hair is designated into how long your hair will stay in a growing phase and based on genetics. And in women, it's estrogen. So women who have better levels and production of estrogen will have longer, thicker hair because their hair will stay in the growing phase longer so that they can grow it longer. And hair estrogen affects not only the growth rate and the time spent in antigen, but also helps when you have adequate estrogen to have more hair in the frontal part of the scalp. So if you see women and they have really thin hair in the front, then that's a sign that they probably don't have adequate estrogen. It's not just about testosterone. It's about estrogen Oops, and hair density decreases, of course, with age. So women have, you know, like fewer hair plugs coming out of their, their scalp. And it, this typically starts in the early 40s. So um, that's why I'm very promoting of starting hormone, re hormone re replacement in the perimenopause. We know that vascular changes and a lot of bone loss, collagen loss, you know, is lost long before the final menstrual period. Remember, that's an artificially made up designated definition, 12 consecutive months without a period. That's the end of the road not the big middle or the beginning, and problems happen as estrogen levels decline. Also, if you start women on estrogen during the perimenopause, they're less likely to have these crazy spikes and dips because they have like a safety net where they can't get below a certain amount. So um, we talked about the hair phases and estrogen prolongs the, the growth phase. And 
when women go on breast cancer treatment, which typically involves aromatase inhibitors um, to block the production of estrogen, they will invariably lose a lot of hair, get a lot of hair thinning. And I don't think anyone even tells them about that. There's so many problems with aromatase inhibitors that, um, and I feel that they're overused, but that's another story for another day talking about breast cancer treatment. Um, and, you know, we don't want as women or men either, we don't want to lose like all our hair and estrogen decreases the amount of time that the hair is lost and prolongs antigen growth phase and helps to maintain a hair distribution that includes a lot of hair in the front as well. And um, so this, these are all really important things. Estrogen receptors are involved in you know, the, all the different aspects, just like of every layer of the skin, every it's everything involving the hair as well is involved with estrogen. Now, I put together a few little tips. Um, soap is not great for skin. Um, I personally just share all my little secrets if you want to. Um, I use shea butter. I think it's fantastic. It has a lot of healing um, properties and you can get it's very um, affordable and you can get organic and you just work it into a paste and you can put it like on your face and then you can wash it off and like get a little washcloth and just kind of wipe it off and your skin is perfectly clean like unless you have a lot of grease or something you know you don't really what the heck do you need like soap on your face for um and um you know if you want then what i like to use is more shea butter you know and just kind of leave it put it on when the face and then put a layer on, you know, and just, you can use it. And hot, hot showers, I actually love hot baths, but they're not great for skin, okay? They take out all the, the oils and such. And we overwash our skin and take off the protective coatings and oils. So um, we don't need to, to do that. And, um, you know, be careful of any kind of sunscreen use, make sure it's not toxic and preferably a mineral-based. Um, eating a lot of antioxidants and phytoestrogens. Most all the food that you think has magical ingredients, they're actually phytoestrogens like resveratrol. You know, these are polyphenols. That's actually a phytoestrogen. Quercetin, that's a phytoestrogen. Elagic acid that turns into um, urolithin, that's phytoestrogen. Of course, um, the um, lignans that come from like seeds, like flax seeds, those are phytoestrogens. Um, isoflavones from soy, those are phytoestrogens. I mean, almost all these magical polyphenols, turns out they're actually phytoestrogens, but they're really good for the skin. So it's, I call it nature's gift to us. And there's actually some data, if you eat three ounces of unprocessed soy, like soybeans or edamame, um, it will be very good for your skin. or cortisol. Cortisol is a, um, a type of a, you know, it's a catabolic hormone. It breaks skin down. So we all know people who have Cushing's disease will have stretch marks in their skin. Their skin is really literally kind of disintegrating. Um, so we do not want to have a lot of stress and high cortisol unless we really want to accelerate the skin breakdown and aging, which we don't. Okay. Exercise actually improves um, skin. So I mean, is there anything that, es that exercise doesn't help? I don't think so. It's like magic. So exercise is great for the skin. And then some of the products that you can look at is hyaluronic acid can be helpful. You can put on topically or take orally. Um, collagen, it's a mixed bag, but there is some data that if you actually consume collagen, it actually improves your collagen, but not, I don't think, if you don't have estrogen on board. Everything works better when you have estrogen, not when you don't. And all, you know, antioxidant, vitamins, and protein. You can't repair if you don't have enough protein. And as we age, we definitely need more protein. So we, I mean, we don't want to give tons of protein to young people, but as, once we get like in our 60s and older, especially, you know, women, we really need to have more protein in our diet, particularly at breakfast. By the way, having a lot of protein for breakfast helps regulate the appetite for the rest of the day. And then, you know, there's conventional 
products, you know, retinols and different like salicylic acid, you know, finasteride, not a fan, low dose minoxidil, I want to mention. So that's become all the rage. And um, it can go very, very low doses, like 0.5 milligrams. What I'm typically doing is it comes as a commercial product at 2.5 milligrams minoxidil. You can, and then you cut the tablet in half. So you get 1.25 milligrams, take it once a morning in the morning. Most people tolerate it. I haven't had any problems. Like I said, I've only been using it for a couple of months. I have to wait and see. It takes time for hair to grow back. But um, the published data on low dose minoxidil for all forms of alopecia, um, androgenic, um, even al 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 alopecia areata, and effluviums. It helps to grow the hair back from effluviums too. So of course, that's not should not be used in isolation. You need to do all the other things in terms of diet and so on. And then there are people doing all these other things like microneedling, um, PRP, plastic surgery, different kinds of lasers and peels. In my office, we do a type of peel called Vipeel, and we're getting amazing results. I use it for people to try to get more like a jump start. Well, it's great for acne scarring, um, and that's such a downer for people to have acne scarring. So this is pretty good. And um, also um, for wrinkles. So it kind of gives you a jump start on getting rid of, of wrinkles. I already mentioned all the phytoestrogens, but they are amazing. They also reduce um, skin cancers by eating all these foods with phytoestrogens, which is basically a plant-based diet because all nuts and seeds and legumes and um, whole grains, vegetables, fruits, they all have phytoestrogens. So it's, if you eat a plant-based diet, you're gonna get plenty. I mentioned resveratrol in the skin of red grapes um, and it increases the functionality and lifespan of mitochondria by up, up, uh, regulating mitochondrial superoxide dismutase, which works in the presence of estrogen to maintain proper mitochondrial function and health. So resveratrol um, is a food, you know, from, it's from a food, but it um, can act as a, like a replacement for estrogen. Like that's like a miracle. That's true for all of these phytoestrogens. So aging doesn't have to be, you know, as dismal as it is painted in, in many ways. We can, we can maintain beautiful skin, by maintaining a great diet, exercising, controlling stress, and taking hormones. How simple is that? We can all do it. Thank you. Excellent. As usual. Fantastic. So let's see, how am I sharing? Great talk as usual, Dr. Grish. Well, thanks. Well, thanks for hanging in there with me. And, um, you know, we want to make people happy and like they will enjoy looking in the mirror and touching their skin and have other people touching them so that they can feel good about themselves inside and outside. Hey, thank you so much. We have lots of comments and questions for you. So um, let's take it from the top. So, uh, okay. Um, someone had to ask, how do you increase prolactin levels to treat treatment resistance, something left out? I'm not sure that was, that might've been before you got here, but. Okay, increasing prolactin. That's, what it's, um, that's the question. Okay. Stimulate nipples. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, there's a couple of drugs that do it. I think I put some answers there. Uh, respiratrol, uh, okay. uh, 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 respiratrol does it. Uh, respiratrol. Uh, respiratrol. Um, it does oh. it. Um, so you have to give an antidepressant. Reglan, reglan opioids will do it. Oatmeal, barley, fenugreek, milk, oh. Okay. That's okay. all new to me. Thank you. Okay. Um, what's the dose of uh, estradiol for skin and wrinkles and what base do you have it compounded in? Okay. So this is my own thing. Now the compounding pharmacy that I use, um, most commonly is, um, Harbor, 
so they're in Costa Mesa, but they ship like they have like licenses in like almost every state too. Um, and they made their own product that I call like the hormone skin cream that combines um, estrogen, progesterone, and also some other little like peptides and some acids and antioxidants. So they have like their own special formula. My patients actually love it. So if it's something that you want to like consider, just uh, contact Harbor Compounding Pharmacy and you can try it with your patients. Um, and um, I have um, some of my own daughters using it. They love it. Um, for myself as well, I have um, I use estradiol cream. It comes in a little syringe and the concentration is um, it's one milligram per 0.1 milliliters. So if you have a syringe that has three centimeters, um, three milliliters, then each little line is one milligram of estradiol. So each little line on this little, like it's like a tuberculin syringe kind of thing. So I usually put a couple of milligrams of estradiol on my face every day and it will be absorbed. So when you give the, the product that they use, the that Harbor Compounding makes is pretty small, okay? Um, but the, what I'm using is like two milligrams. So I, that's part of my hormone dosing. So I, I conclude that in my dosing, but rather than like we, we have women who put like estrogen creams and such that they're using and they're putting it like on their inner arm or on their thigh. And then it's like, it occurred to me, like, as I learned more and more about skin and I read the research, it's like, what the heck do I care about? You know, particularly my inner arm or my leg, you know, I want it on my face. So I just started doing it myself. This is my own creation. And it does get absorbed because I've measured the levels. I mean, why would it not get absorbed through the skin if it's absorbed through other parts of the skin? It's all concocted anyway. Nature never intended us to give hormones through the skin. We just adapted the skin to that purpose, you know? And um, so I just like put it around my eyes and I put it like, like between my eyebrows and around my upper lip, you know, all the places people tend to wrinkle. And I think it really helps. So I just use like a couple of milligrams a day of estradiol, but there's no reason if you have patients that are applying their, they're on an estrogen that's compounded. Now, obviously I wouldn't do this with a commercial alcohol based gel. I wouldn't put alcohol product on my face, nor would I use a pad. I mean, how would a patch help? But if you're using compounded estrogen in a cream, you can talk to your compounding pharmacy and get it in a, a concentrated little form. And then instead of putting it somewhere else, just tell them put it on their face. I guarantee you it's absorbed. And then you get like double benefits. You get systemic benefits and you get local skin benefits. So that's what I do. Oh, okay, that's a new one on me. So, but just to be clear, if, you, if it's, it's just plain estradiol, right? It's not it's a- It's plain estradiol. It's the, not a I, combo, it doesn't have- Now what I use, what I use is just plain estradiol. The product that Harbor Compounding makes that they market is the blend of estrogen. Uh, they have some estriol in it. They have progesterone and they have all this other, like, you know, skin related stuff like acids and um, vitamin C and antioxidants and stuff like that. So they have their own special blend. But um, for me, and my patients love it. Okay. But for me personally, I'm just taking straight old estradiol cream, nothing else in it. And I'm just mm -hmm. applying it directly to my face because I, I read the literature, you know, I read all these studies and that's what they use straight estradiol right to the skin. Two weeks, you get reduced wrinkles. You know, you have rapid healing. Like, okay, that sold me. Okay, great. Um, the next one is Dr. Horvitz. I'm not sure I understand the question. Use topical hormones as well for normal HRT with bioidentical question. Mark. I'm not sure what that. Yeah, so that's, you know, right, if you're, you can use, right, what I do um, is if some, if a woman is on compounded estrogen, estradiol cream, then I tell her to start applying all or some of it to her face. If she is using a patch or an alcohol-based gel, like estrogel or divigel, I'm not going to put alcohol-based gels on their face. And I, a, a patch is not useful for that purpose. Then I use the product from Harbor that has these smaller doses and all this other, you know, like 
magic stuff mixed in with it. So it's not part of their hormone replacement therapy at all. It's strictly a skincare product. So, so I, I individualize it based on whatever my patient happens to be using, because for my patients, I use it all. You know, I, I base it on their age, their personal choice, the cost issues, you know, finances. So I don't just use the same thing on everybody. I, I'll use the entire array of every um, type of product out there. <clears throat> Okay. Um, what's the dose of the facial estrogen? I know you just answered it. So just so we're clear. Um, um, what, I, what I use myself, mm -hmm. it's one milligram per 0. 0.1 yeah. milliliter. Right. Okay. Uh, and Dr. Monty says, again, would like to know the dose for the facial. And I've seen it mixed with GHKU, whatever. Well, that sounds like a peptide, but if you talk to comp, uh, like Harbor or your own personal, you know, choice of compounding pharmacies, they can, you know, concoct stuff like that too. I, like I said, the special skin formulation that Harbor makes, I believe they include some different peptides as well as some estrogen and progesterone. But there, I didn't talk about progesterone. Progesterone also can be beneficial to the skin. There's published data on that as well. Um, I don't use progesterone cream on my face, but you know, that can be also included. And um, I would never on a woman put testosterone on her face ever because that can potentially grow hair and that would not make your woman patient happy. Trust me. Yeah. Can uh, women age 83 who had ovarian cancer use estradiol cream? Well, not if you ask the general public of doctors, you know, the general doctor population, in my opinion, you're never too old. Because if you can resurrect, I mean, we we have data showing estrogen receptor beta goes down in skin. We know that there are changes with age, but we know that you can have benefits to the skin, to the vagina. Um, we have no data. I mean, zero data on women in their 80s starting estrogen. We have no data. So I would definitely document, document, document that, you know, you discuss it with the patient. She understands there's no published data on, on benefits or safety, but she wants to try it. She's fully informed. Um, and, um, you know, it's FDA approved for bones. When you, I mean, in the 80s is getting up there, but when you look at what they're doing for bone, they're starting women like around 50 on prolia. You know, prolia, it's like crazy yeah. stuff. And you can't get people off of it. There's no long-term data. And it's actually being kind of bad mouth now more and more by the um, rheumatologists and the um, endocrinologists because there's like no exit strategy for that drug ever. When you stop it, the bone just disappears. And, you know, bisphosphonates is, they're terrible in terms of long, you can't, no long-term use. And they came up with this ridiculous like expression that after five years of use, you have to stop it. You have to stop it because it's toxic, but they call it taking a drug holiday. Like you're going on a vacation. It's like the craziest talk about marketing, right? Oh, you're going on a drug holiday. They don't say you got to stop it because it's really toxic. No, they say drug holiday, you know, and now the American College of Physicians just this past week came out with their new recommendations for treating osteoporosis. The first line of therapy bisphosphonates. And they included zero. They even put a little addendum. We did not even address estrogen at all in our paper. Not at all. Was not even touched on. Like how horrible is that? They didn't even bring up the subject of hormones for women for bone health. It's, you know, collagen is very key to joint health, bone health, skin health, actually vascular health. What structure in the body doesn't involve collagen? right? And collagen is essential to life. And you make collagen in the presence of estradiol, and you can't make collagen properly in an estradiol deficient body. And the solution is in a bisphosphonate. And the other thing about bones is that estradiol not only prevents uncontrolled bone loss through the action of the osteoclast, specialized modified macrophages in the bone, but they also stimulate osteoblast to make more bone. This is all controlled through the special cells in the bone called osteocytes, which control the osteoclast and the osteoblast so that you have this perfect balance of bone removal and bone building. And that only and only is controlled by estradiol. There's no drug that does that. So anyway, you know, you can see 
that collagen is essential for everything. So the solution is not a bisphosphonate or prolia, but that's what the conventional medical world is doing. So if I had an 83 year old who has osteoporosis, um, as, you know, like the idea of putting her on those drugs is so like not pleasant to me. So I would rather put her on estrogen even at 83 to try to help her bones to be better. And um, that is not the standard of care. That is my care. I, and I know you touched on this before, but just um, so, you know, the recommendations that a, a female uh, 10 years post menopause, if she's not been on uh, uh, estrogen or hormones is not to be put on them. And after 10, 10 years on, on uh, uh, hormone replacement, they should be stopped. I mean, no, that's the official recommendation. The official, well, the, the, this, there is no official for when to stop, but the, of course, the mantra that came out of the Women's Health Initiative was smallest dose for shortest time. And originally they said, stop after five years, you know, some said, okay, 10 years, but the general feeling in the medical community is that once you hit 60, you should just stop hormones, just stop them abruptly, which by the way, increases the risk of a heart attack in a woman. It's like crazy, you know? So they just say, okay, you're 60, you're too old to be on hormones anymore, so just stop them. Like what, you know? And you know what, we can always give you Prozac. By the way, that's what Medicare recommends. They say at age 65, we, you, you know, cause that's when Medicare comes into play, you know? So if you're 65 and you've still been on hormones, they say, we're not gonna cover this, you're too old, but here's some solutions. You can go on Prozac or bisphosphonate. That's literally in their literature. I've seen the letters and um, that is crazy cause that's not, not exactly a replacement. Um, so, but so the general public, the general doctor community is stop hormones at age 60. Don't start them if you're over 60. That's kind of how it goes. Yeah. And so I, I don't I, I don't know if it's changed, but I, when I started doing this, it was um, the first line was was venophylaxin effexor. That was that was supposed to be your first line. For, well, for menopausal that effexor, symptoms. yes, and that was yeah. and Paxil Paxil was very popular. <laughs> yeah. Right, and then after that, it was uh, if that doesn't work, then either um, clonidine, uh, specifically mentioned synthetic progesterone. And then gabapentin, oh. and then gabapentin. Yeah. And gabapentin is like now the go-to for everything, right? Because you can't use opioids. So, oh my God, it seems like there's, by the way, there's data that if you give post-operative elderly people, elderly being defined as 65 plus, if you give them gabapentin post-operatively, you increase their mortality. There you go. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm just telling you what. I know, I know, but I'm just I'm sure saying you know that this. the new data is not just, very encouraging for gabapentin postoperatively and for pain in elderly people. Not so great. I know it's a problem, but yeah, I know that it's insanity and the, you know, the unwarranted fear of human bioidentical hormones is so bizarre. You know, when you think about it, it's just so crazy. Like no one has that fear for thyroid hormone, like it's just another hormone. Uh, thi so, thyroid thyroid hormones are um, if the TSH is greater than ten, use synthroid. If it's four and a half to ten, and they have symptoms, use synthroid. If it's under four and a half, you're crazy. That's that's the. That's, <laughs> well, that's, yeah. That's, well, I don't that's, know. That's, 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 that's thyroid. That's thyroid. Well, I don't agree with <laughs> everything for sure with thyroid, but at least they don't say at a certain age you have to stop it if you're on it. Yeah. At least yeah. they don't yeah. say you're too old right. for thyroid hormone, like they say for women. <laughs> you're too old to have estrogen in your body, so. Get it out. Get it out. Treatment options for hormonal acne after you clean up the diet and no gut dysbiosis. Well, I interesting. I actually, that skin product that I told you about that Harbor Compounding makes, it has the estrogen, the progesterone, and then the like little peptides and the vitamin C and the acids and all. I'm, that's not, they're not, they didn't even market that. They market it for wrinkles, but I'm using it for acne. I'm getting great response. Okay. Now I also use spironolactone. Um, spironolactone is a pharmaceutical that blocks the conversion of um, testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. So it's going to, but it, it doesn't seem to have like, it's not like a, a universal blocker of 5-alpha reductase and it lowers the production of testosterone. And um, acne is a huge problem for causing depression and so on. And there's actually published studies that if you use spironolactone, that virtually 100% of women will have 100% clearance of acne by two years. And what you do is you get them to clearance 
And that could be three months, six months, one year, whatever it takes. And then you start dropping the dose. Okay, so you don't stay, you go to whatever dose you have to with a maximum of 100 milligrams twice a day. And then once you hold steady and you've cleared the acne, you start dropping the dose. And, um, and while you're cleaning up the diet and then you can get them off of it. So this is not a lifetime drug use. This is um, to get things under control while you're cleaning up the inflammation. And, and by the way, oh my gosh, stress has such an effect on the skin. Um, I mentioned like cortisol, and um, they've done studies where you, you can actually treat severe acne with hypnotherapy, nothing else, just hypnotherapy and have total clearance. So stress is not a small component of acne. So if you have patients that have a lot of acne, always think what's going on in their lives? You know, these are stressed out people. Now it's of course bi-directional. Acne causes stress, stress causes acne. But if you don't address the stress component, you're, you're never gonna really clear the acne. Regarding DHT in men and large prostates, um, current paradigm is 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. Would you su suggest trying to lower inflammation instead? Uh, for example, well, tumor I would. Oh yeah, like yeah, curcumin is great for that. You know, um, the absorbable type of turmeric. So you know, lifestyle. So when men have an enlarged prostate, and remember, I don't really deal a ton with men, but an enlarged prostate is a sign of inflammation of the prostate. Okay, and um, the prostate is the analogous organ to the female uterus. Okay, and that's a, sort of an interesting thing, and it it also can make estrogen locally inside itself. Um, and so remember inflammation also upregulates aromatase and you'll convert your androgens into estrogens and that will happen in the prostate itself. So everything you can do to lower um, inflammation is going to improve prostate health. The reality is that if you have a guy who literally can't pee because his prostate is really obstruct, causing an obstruction problem, um, then he might need to have surgery or maybe he does need to go on the big gun pharmaceuticals while you're working on it. So everything that I do works best as a preventative. I'm not so great with end-stage disease, whether it's end-stage heart failure, kidney failure, the most severe stages of osteoporosis or an enlarged prostate. I don't really know how to make a really, really enlarged prostate just shrink away. So I'm much better at prevention than I am at like curing a really enlarged prostate. Um, we're stuck, you know, once it's that big and it's causing obstruction, but if it's early stage and there's inflammation, um, so I'm big on, mar you know, measuring inflammation markers, we can intervene before it keeps growing. And that's mm -hmm. where, where I do best is preventing. We, we had on a few weeks ago, um, and it, it, it's in our, it's on our website. The video is Dr. Evans is an integrative um, radiologist, an interventional radiologist. He does uh, embolization of the, uh, the the prostatic arteries, and he seems to have a pretty good track record with uh, reducing prostate sizes, um, especially in really enlarged prostates. That way. Well, that's so interesting because you know they do uterine artery embolization. Right. Drink fibroids and they're the analogous organs. So yeah. I guess it, it has to be somebody to think of that, right? Yeah. So it's it, it for those of you out there in, in TV land, it is on our website. It's Dr. Evans is the integra integrative um, uh, uh, radiology. And just to remind everybody, AOSRD.org slash webinars. That's where the all, all of our videos are, are including this one will be. Um, let me see. I had to get this. Uh, let's see. I, have, I lost my place since I put that in. Okay. Another paradigm for GYN is to place women on hormonal contraceptives to treat uterine cysts. Um, this is uh, the, the doctor, the, Mr. Hartman, to spike prolactin, shut off progesterone, testosterone, and estrogen, which is the reason for proliferative disease. But would you suggest it is estrone that is causing this? Perhaps a less barbaric method than birth control should be standard. Um, I use birth control for like emergency medical use. Like if some reproductive age woman is having massive bleeding with her periods and she's like super anemic and so on. But, you know, I'm using it as a drug to try to control the bleeding. 
But um, I really feel sad that we don't have better contraceptives out there because I don't want people to have unwanted pregnancies. But you have to always keep in mind that birth control pills are pro-inflammatory. They lower T regulatory cells. They cause gut dysbiosis, circadian rhythm disorder. Um, they can increase um, suicidal ideation in younger women. You never, if you start early, like in your teens, which we don't have data after 20, but we have data published. If you start birth control pills in your teens, which is so standard now, you increase the lifetime risk for cardiovascular events in women, and you will never optimize bone health. Um, the, the amount of bone that's made in the first five years after puberty is really dramatic. It's like 40% of bone is acquired in the first four years after um, you know, the menarche. And that's often the years that girls are put on birth control pills now. So they're put on birth control pills during their, both, their most robust bone growing years. So they never optimize that. They also don't optimize joint health because without proper estradiol, you don't create the proper health of ligaments and tendons. So we're seeing injuries to like shoulders when the girls go out, they're dancing and they're doing like Zumba classes and they're doing nothing and they're tearing, ripping and tearing, you know, their shoulders and their hips and knees and they're getting labrum tears and all this crazy stuff at a very young age, you know, so, um, and you're changing the hormone receptors, you know, because just like use it or lose it. So the hormone receptors are going to become more dysfunctional. So I am not a fan, obviously, of unwanted pregnancies, but I'm really not a fan of chronic long-term birth control pill use for any purpose. Um, I think if they're going to be used to try to use them at an older age and try to try to keep it to a, as few a, of months or years as possible, but I don't have the solution to, for contraceptives, you know? Um, I'd love to say I invented something and it's great, so I recommend using all the different um, barrier methods and using two at a time if necessary. And I don't even know what to say in all the states where you know they'll you know decapitate the doctors if if the girl you know has um, a medical abortion or something. So we have a lot of problems, you know. In many of the states now, they can't the dermatologists can't use bironolactone. They can't use um, not that I'm a lover of Accutane. But, you know, they can't use the drugs that have teratogenic effects because there's no option if something happens by accident. So, you know, we, we live in a complex world, but um, birth control pills are not health pills. And so they can be used in emergency situations to treat particular situations, but I would definitely not consider them health pills. Is there something to do for men when skin is super thin and easily bruises and heals poorly? Um, well, I, I think that progesterone cream for men could on the skin, um, could have a lot of potential benefit. I don't know I'm, I'm of a lot of data on that, but we do know there is benefit to progesterone and, um, men certainly need progesterone. And, um, I think that that would be a good thing to do. Um, and also maintain their testosterone. I'm not saying put testosterone all over their face, although I think you could definitely put it in the hair growing areas. Um, but I don't, um, but I think everything in a man that maintains health um, requires adequate testosterone. And that, you know, is really a problem when men don't have enough. And much of the benefit of testosterone, I would say at least half is from its conversion within the different tissues themselves and organs into estradiol because testosterone turns into estradiol. So men need that testosterone for skin health. Um, and I don't know of a lot of data on giving testosterone cream on the face, but I would experiment with it. Um, and you know, I would also consider progesterone cream as well. And then mm -hmm. systemic, systemic testosterone and be proactive once again, you know, late stage skin conditions are harder to deal with too, of course. Okay. Uh, what, what would a dose be for a male for progesterone? Is it um, well, or? this is, okay, so this is concocted by me, okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, like 20 milligrams. Okay. Would you use a cream or, or a, a cream. cream? Okay. Uh, do we use topical E in men and women for venous stasis ulcers? Oh, you know, um, vitamin E is is great for skin. I use it for um, 
like when women have vulvitis, you know, it could be from whatever, you know, contact dermatitis. It could be like the, the labial skin is like irritated from a yeast infection, from the yeast coming out. If you take a vitamin E gel cap, like a good one, and you put a pin in it and you press out the oil from in that little vitamin E gel cap, you can put it on any skin anywhere and it really promotes healing. So I'm glad that whoever brought that up, that's a very good comment because vitamin E is very good for skin. Vitamin we, e oil. We've used it for scars and things for a long yeah, time. That's really good. Yeah, yeah. Um, when using tamoxifen in breast cancer and the skin crepes, is there a treatment for it for that? So, nope. Okay. Well, you know, maybe more protein, put hyaluronic acid on it. I'm just guessing here. Um, sounds like age spots are similar to having acanthosis nigrans, which signals increased insulin resistance. Well, acanthosis nigrans definitely shows insulin resistance. And what was the first part? Um, uh, age spots. Oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, if you think about it, that's a very good point. Right. Acanthosis nigrahan is an inflammatory process that's related to insulin resistance and you have hyperpigmentation. So there you go. Insulin resistance is a inflammatory status and so is hyperpigmentation. But so often that's not really thought about. Like, what is the significance of this hyperpigmentation? Why is this happening? And it's, you know, upregulation of the production of of melanin by the melanocytes because of inflammation. Okay. Uh, what about vitamin C at all? Oh yeah, vitamin C is great for skin. They, they have so many commercial products with vitamin C. Basically anything that takes down inflammation in the skin is gonna be good for the skin. So vitamin C, all antioxidants, yes. Okay, um, great, great talk as always. A couple of comments, got, a, got about a half a dozen of those. How high a dose do you use for topical estradiol? Um, the most I've ever used is four milligrams total a yep. day. Um, wonderful presentation. Can you put your website back up? I don't know, is that directed to you or, or, or to me? So I'm not sure. Um, do you have your website? Could you put that in for us? There you go. Come visit me. There you go, okay. Okay. And those are my be... books. And I'm going to write a new one on breast cancer. That's my next one coming up. Um, uh, will we have all the slides to refer, refer to? Oh, you, you know what? I'll, I can send them to you. Okay. okay. I'll send yeah. you a yeah. slide. And we'll put them up. There on may the be a few typos. Sorry, guys. I just didn't, I put this together kind of fast. So it's sorry okay. about it. We're, 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 we're not. And it'll be on our website, aosrd.org slash webinars. Um, and I think that's about it. A couple okay. of more great presentations. And thank you so much again. You know, we really appreciate it. I mean, this has been almost two hours and it went by like 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 in a in a, in a minute. Thanks so much. Well, it's always nice when I can and, join my tribe. And uh, it gave gave uh, Stephen Hartman some time to string a couple of new, more tennis rackets while while he was. Oh, well, good. <laughs> so well, I have to give you a hard time about it. You know that. Well, it's, you know, who says you can't do two productive things at the That's same right. time. That's right. So um, thank you again. Thank well, you so much. Um, have you know, a good we, night, we everyone. We really appreciate it. Um, we love having you on. And um, I think we're going to try and get a, a something together for the end of the summer um, for our group. So I hope you'll be you'll be part of it. Oh, that sounds so great. Next <laughs> week, next week, we're going to have uh, Dr. Uh, Donald Dennis. He is a, a, a ENT surgeon. And he deals with um, mold and mold toxicity, um, and different than Dr. Campbell. So, and it just worked out that the week after, the week after that, we have Dr. Campbell back. So, um, Andrew like Campbell. Great lineup. So, yeah. So we have two. We're going to have two weeks of mold and mold toxicity, but you're going to hear some very different things. So, um, Dr. Dennis is a, a good old boy from North Carolina, and he's got a little bit of an accent, and he's got he's got some unique. Uh, or perspective on things. And again, um, thank you again, Dr. Gersh, as, as always. Dr. Smith was supposed to be on and she keeps uh, dodging me now. So if you get in touch with her, please tell her we're, we're looking for her. Um, and uh, February 21st, Peter McCullough will be here. Tell your friends, tell your enemies, and um, you know, it, it, it'll be fireworks as always.
with him. So, okay. Um, thank you all so much. I'm going to say good night. Uh, unless anybody else have any other questions, comments, John. You still all there? good, man. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, and uh, thank you so much. And uh, I hope to see you soon in person there, Dr. Gersh. So um, that'd be great. So everybody take care and um, good night.